Okay, um, so we're going to start talking about how teams allow multiple students and multiple mentors to all collaborate on the robot design. Uh, some of the, um, I guess I'll start and we can kind of fill in as other people talk about how they do it. Um, one of the things that we do, if I get my sharing working. Um, so one of the things we do that helps with collaboration a lot is we have a Google slide deck that we use for our entire season design stuff. Um, so kind of at the start of the season, it, it contains all of like our strategy ideas from kickoff and there's that whole first week of kind of figuring out what we're going to build. Um, lots of pictures of past robots and things. So everybody's kind of getting that design inspiration um, together without having to necessarily be in the same room all the time or being in the same, like missing something in Slack and then forgetting it exists. Um, so this kind of just holds it all without having to like dig through Slack conversations or anything. When you actually have something you really want to kind of document, you have that ability to do so um, in something that's gonna hold over for the whole season. And it's also nice we can publish this. We could, this is public. We publish it at the end of the end of our season somewhere in there um, when we knew it wasn't gonna get too many live edits um, from students. Is there a reason that you pick Google Slides over a more wiki type software deal? Uh, Google Slides is incredibly accessible for the students, right? They can all edit it on their phones. They know how to do it. Um, they're pretty good at bringing images in and doing all the data and stuff. They can look at it on whatever device they have very, very simply. Um, I'm sure there is a, like, it could very easily be Google Doc. We've had Google Docs in past seasons, but then as you try to like, organized stuff, it gets kind of lost and it's hard to even reference things. We're here and be like, oh, slide, whatever. We can link directly to slides in the Slack to get people there. Um, but you can kind of do in docs and stuff too. This just works for us. We do a lot more stuff in slides now, actually. We do our, um, our like pit scouting and robot scouting stuff all happens in slides now. So like teams get multiple slides at every event. Um, and it's just super accessible for the kids to do it that way. I'm just important. starting to see how many slides there are in this. Oh, there's, there's as hundreds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are hundreds. Um, <laughs> very big decks. Um, as you get through kind of our design stuff, we get into our weekly design reviews. So every Tuesday, we go through and basically each, uh, all the students kind of update the progress, and especially the sub-team leads are just giving updates to the entire team to kind of talk about where they are, what's worked through the week, um, and what they still need to work on. Um, this also helps since we're public and we can publish it all. It's very easy for us to do that every week as we just publish the slides onto um, our blog, which makes it nice and simple for me to do that. Um, and so like they each, by the week two, they each had their, or their sub team leads had their stuff and they were able to go through and kind of decide what we were working on, show the prototypes, show some of the CAD. Um, all the way through like some of their data that they were collecting, right? Trying to figure out shooter angles, all of that stuff got put up on here. So the entire team was updated about everything that was happening through every subsystem, ideally. Um, the other thing we do is we have a Google sheet where we keep all of the um, kind of like the hard numbers for everything where you could have something like this imported in your on shape file or some other way for your team to get to it. Um, so the team, when the team needs to do some sort of mechanical calculation. This is how we do chain calculations, gears, all of that. Um, the kids learn how to do it here. And it's a one place where they know it exists. They don't have to like figure out other calculators. They always do. Like some kids have other calculators that they like better and they will use on occasion, but ideally it still comes in and gets documented into here somehow. Um, so we can go through and every electrical thing can get documented and all that. This is the public one, so this is empty. Um, so that's one of the ways we do things to kind of tie everything together. Um, and then since we haven't been using Onshape, all of our actual CAD gets done in, um, gets done with GrabCAD. Um, so like this is the GrabCAD folder for our 2020 robot. Um, and we can see all the updates. There were 847 commits to it. Um, throughout the year, all the different folders. So basically every sub team design group has their own folder that they're using, that they're updating things in for the most part. The highest level robot assembly is controlled largely by me. Um, and then basically when the kids need to update it, they just have to ask me and make sure that I'm not doing anything in it or no one else is. Um, 
because we don't go through and do all the lock stuff because all the the actual SolidWorks integration stuff kind of broke a little while ago. It sometimes works, um, but it hasn't in our version of SolidWorks for a while. Um, and that's how we keep everything together. So this one just has all the subsystems imported as subassemblies, made it together, and then if they need to change their mates or anything, they go in and do that when they need to. Um, and that keeps it largely, um, it keeps it largely with everybody working in the area where they know they're kind of in charge. And if somebody needs to go in and edit something, they just have to go talk to or message that sub team lead and make sure it's okay that they do make that actual edit. Uh, yeah, in addition, there's our full library that we did a while ago that gets updated relatively consistently that is similar to MKCAD. It doesn't have nearly as many configurable stuff and all of that fast updating stuff that they have. Um, but it goes through and has all the part files for everything we can need um, from lots of manufacturers and everything else like that. Um, does anyone have any questions or want to share how their team kind of goes about doing this stuff? I guess, does anybody else have, or how many people, how many do, like people are actually working on designs for people's robots? Or is it a few, is it a lot? Like we'll have, this year we probably had about 14 or 15 people doing CAD on the robot. Wow. Wait, three. <laughs> Did you Where's say it? you said fifteen, not five, right? No, we yeah, we'll have close to like <laughs> we'll have close to it's about fifteen. So we'll have myself and then there's normally about two ish people per subsystem, depending on the subsystem, kind of working together, two to three. Um, and they'll all submit at different times depending on who gets the who logs in and who runs it. And with Holy five ish systems, it's about right. And you're, and you're still using GrabCAD right now? Yeah, and it's all done through GrabCAD. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so everybody just knows what subsystem they have, and then they just don't, they largely don't edit it unless they know they come in for help. So, like, the, um, we'll have times where, like, our top, like me or one of our top CAD kids will be like, oh, we need to go work on your thing. You're locked out of it for a little while. Don't update. We're going to fix whatever's going on that we know needs to get done right now. And then you can have it back in a little bit, right? So I think we had to do that a couple times in like elevator where like our climber got behind and we needed to go through and fix something because our head climber student was also in charge of like chairman. So he was back and forth a lot. Um, yeah, we had a nightmare. I mean, we've been using GrabCAD and it just, it was awful this year. It was like, if you don't, even a lot of our adults were, and we don't have nearly as many people dealing with the CAD, but even our adults were super struggling with close your application, then push. Because if you don't, it doesn't, it doesn't count. And so the number of times that we had to go in and I had to go in and fix that stuff was awful. So that, that alone is motivating me to make on shape work. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, we do a lot to make sure the kids get in the habit of double checking what gets pushed. Yeah, it's uh, not the students that are the problem in this case. <laughs> I, Training adults is harder than kids sometimes. There is a benefit <laughs> to a team that has one at technical mentoring. So <laughs> well, we have to train the kids. So like so, our team uh, with Onshape had, maybe there were like four or five, you know, students and mentors designing, but like almost every student was able to like pop in and just like get a measurement or just check it out. And it just makes it so easy for anyone who's not even a designer to just kind of stay in tune with what's going on. Well, that's great. I remember when my son was on disco and, the other CAD guy didn't show up and everybody's waiting like to build what he had just designed. But fortunately my son had the CAD. So he's there telling everybody you need to cut a tube this long. You need it. But he was the only one that had the uh, solid works loaded. Yeah. That's one yeah thing the, that's the, the accessibility is really what I hoped grab CAD would do for us that everybody could kind of be a part of it, even if you're not like a CAD person, but it just never really turned out that way. One thing that we found nice about Onshape that we, we weren't really expecting is that it has uh, like an iPad or I, like a iOS app where like we're in the back of the shop rather than dragging a laptop back there, you know, to look where a part should be. They can look through, uh, you know, look through the CAD basically on, on an iPad and kind of, 
you know, look everything around. So that's, that's been handy without, you know, just trying to take, take the drawing where you are. One time on yeah, a dare, yeah. one time on a dare, I loaded it on my phone and, you know, loaded up, try to do anything. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, if you had to just look at a small part, you know, and you knew to go there, you know, what's the distance between these two holes? You know, that works. Yeah. yeah, we had one kid that like liked to be a glutton for punishment and would CAD parts on his phone, but I don't uh, recommend that. <laughs> so uh, actually on an Android tablet, I think on the way to, gosh, it probably would have been Atlanta at the time. Uh, on an Android tablet, I CAD it up like the Rev Pro Swerve module and got it all working and everything. So, I mean, you definitely can do it. Um, it can be fun. And that was a long, long about time ago, like, I don't know, four or five years. So I'm sure it's only gotten better since then. Yeah, it's really, it's really changed a lot since we started using it. I mean, configurable parts and assemblies didn't exist. Uh, MKCAD didn't exist. Um, they just introduced exploded views. They just introduced a lot, a big update for appearances. So you can actually assign colors, not just to parts, but to faces. Um, and it'll, it'll import all that stuff from the step files if the step files have that information. Um, so, you know, that was this, maybe last week or this early this week. So it, it's constant updates and they're really, you know, still big updates because Onshapes, I don't know how old it is, six years old. Um, it's still fairly young compared to some of the, the other packages that we use. So what about uh, decals and renderings in Onshape? So rendering would be uh, one of these add-ins that you'd have to go to. Um, you can do decals a little bit. Um, just by projecting text onto, you know, a cylinder or something. I can't. I don't think you can project uh, onto like any surface. It has to just be flat or like a cylindrical surface, right now. Um, but I haven't personally. I like professionally and through FRC. I've never done renderings, so I don't have a good answer to that. Um, yeah, and I know there's some teams who have to do some sort of like a hybrid model where if as much as we're going to try to start using Onshape for some things, a lot, some of our stuff will have to be in SolidWorks just because our sponsor takes native SolidWorks sheet metal files. So some stuff will have to be done and re-imported and brought back in and things when we need it to. Um, and we're still just not sure what our ratio of Onshape to SolidWorks is going to be in the future seasons as we go, but we'll definitely be using it because yeah. there's some parts that absolutely have to be better, so much faster to do an on shape where you have the feature scripts and things like they showed today. Yeah, in the uh, in the past, um, compatibility with uh, manufacturers has been uh, a concern and a, a reason for choosing one software over another. Have you? Uh, done any so there's a button that says save as solidworks in on shape or at least it's advertised on the website have you played with that at all with manufacturers uh, I haven't looked at it to see what it comes out as native or anything I haven't I know you can import and use native solidworks files I don't remember if it kept all the connectivity but it definitely you didn't have to convert it to anything that, to import it yeah, uh, but according to their documentation, you can export parts as SolidWorks 2004, but you're not exporting assemblies. Right, and I, I don't, I doubt it's going to keep, like for us, for the manufacturer side, it's because we have to use their entire like bend table and everything in SolidWorks. So there's some little, like some deep details for manufacturability that I don't think SolidWorks is going to, or Onshape's going to keep that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the exact same reason that the, that we, you know, bend tables and, and that kind of stuff. Because so, uh, Onshape just got sheet metal in the last, what, year and a half, two years, something like that. They didn't have sheet metal for a long time, which was definitely holding us back. Uh, and it's still somewhat holding us back since our 
manu our, our sponsor now wants uses the native files, which they weren't for a while, but now they do. Um, anyone have any questions about like part numbering or anything or how you keep the process from like design to, to build actually going um, and like organize it all? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, our, our team isn't, you know, building super advanced robots, at least up till now. So, you know, honestly, everything's been going through me to keep track of. We have a Trello board that, you know, I update for students to reference, um, but it's not great. I think we're gonna start using part numbers, but um, we don't really, I know Rachel uh, has some stuff that she probably might share with me, but just in general, yeah, you know, how do you up. how do you get students to you know know the priorities and know you know what to do without having to be told? Would be nice. So, so I'm going to share right now. This so this is our this is our part numbering document at least. So this is how our sub team leads attempt to part number robots as they're doing the design work as or part number parts as they're doing the design work. Um, and that lets us relatively quickly look in a folder because again we're still on SolidWorks, so we'll pull up a GrabTed folder or whatever, and we can see kind of how things are supposed to be made just by looking at the part numbers because that part of the part number for us is how the designer intended it to be produced. Um, so if I know if somebody's like, oh, we need to 3D print stuff, they can go into the intake folder and 3D print all the stuff for the intake just by pulling those part numbers really fast, um, which does help. Um, and then I was talking earlier, um, for us at least, the way we do it is our sub team leads are responsible for that sub system all the way through design to it being maintained on the robot. Um, so it's not that they're the one that's gonna build it, but they basically are the project manager for the design aspect and making sure that the parts are produced, powder coated, assembled, spares are made, all of that. And if they, right, and that they're working in conjunction with myself and some of the other um, students who have done it more, if, even if they're on other sub teams and stuff, just to make sure everything's happening. Um, but that's kind of how we work through it is that there's always at least one or two students who it's their job to be the champion of that subsystem and push it through the process. When, when you're, when the various CAD people are designing it, um, earlier you mentioned that you, Alan, kind of review the stuff with them. Um, what sort of stuff do you review? And I guess it'd be interested in what Rachel and Ricky and some of the other people with the more established teams do. Is um, so a lot of it is just making sure it's going to be buildable. Um, a lot of it is going through and like, but even before, throughout the whole process, we're always communicating about material choice, how we want to do something, right? There's a lot of whiteboard meetings of, okay, this is kind of the steps you're going to take to get there and kind of like rough drawings. And then they have to go through and right, take what was written on the whiteboard by whoever's all involved in that conversation, me, them, a couple other design students who may not even be part of that sub team, but they kind of know what's happening and getting it fully into CAD and then all the way through manufacturability. But we were going through and even looking at the CAD, making sure that they have fillets everywhere, making sure it's going to actually fit geometry wise. They're using the correct materials. They're using the correct parts. All of that gets done. Yeah, we do something like that um, where we do, uh, when we have a new subsystem. We just do a design review before we do any big modifications and start building those parts uh, to make sure that it's all done correctly and that there's nothing, there's no surprises in there, like material selection and everything. Also something that I did um, to help out with tonight was if on our team website under resources, the very top resource or one of the top ones is CAD. And so there's a slideshow that we do with the students and it goes through our numbering system and everything, our part numbering system, and then some design philosophies and so forth and one of the big ones has to do with how we deal with solid works and assemblies and how we do mating and who who like i'm pretty much the only person that touches the main assembly the triple zero is what we call it um, so it used to be it used to be a student because i was the one messing it up but now i'm the one that takes care of it it was funny because i would do something and then alex Choi, who's 
who's that's the name you'll see if you go look at the slide deck uh alex would get on my case about it so when uh so after he was gone i had to figure out how to do those things so, i'm uh, definitely the worst person on our team for part numbering like by far like <laughs> i get on all the kids they know to do it right i am terrible at it yeah so i can talk to a little bit uh, you guys can see my screen right yeah um, so I talked a little bit about our numbering scheme. I don't think it's particularly unique, um, but it is pretty straightforward for the team. Um, each subsystem gets a like 100, 200, 300, 400, and they're fairly arbitrary other than drivetrain tends to be 100 because that's where we start. The first uh, 10 numbers of that 100 are for assemblies and all the ones beyond that are for parts. So 100 to 109 would all be assemblies. And then 110 and beyond would all be parts. It just lets them group together at the top of the folder. Um, and then we use uh, this sheet, which is the 2019 sheet. Uh, it, it's a living document, so you can see that at some point we just got busy and stopped maintaining it. But conceptually, you go and the first thing you do before you even save a part is you come and you pull the part number and you reserve it. So I'd say I want to use uh, 124. Or I'd say 125 is available. I'll type 125. You know, if 120, if I wanted to do 124, maybe I wasn't paying attention. I think it highlights that it's red. You can't have two of the same number. Um, it's a part. Who's it belong to? In progress or released? Who pulled the part? Something about it. How many are going to be in the robot? And then what material is it taken from? So is it aluminum or chain or whatever? And then we try to keep a step of what our different machining progressions are. So I guess this is a wheel axle. So you chop it to length. You make sure it's the right length. We have this big problem. So we do all of our machining in-house, which is good and bad. It means that our resources are kind of split between designing the next iteration and just trying to make the next iteration. But it also means student machinists, sometimes they spend hours on parts just to get to the end and find out the original cut link was wrong. So we kind of employ what we call like our uh, machining czar uh, or something. And it's the, every day that we're machining, we have one person that's in charge of just this master list, maintaining this, the checkpoint, signing off on it. We'll print out a drawing and it doesn't have to be super formal, but they'll print out a drawing and say chop and then someone will check it and say, yes, it's the right length. Okay, now we're going to lathe it. Okay, let's check it and make sure the lathe step is correct. Okay, and then so on. And so they check off on each one of these steps. And usually, like a small part like this would go in a zippy bag with a drawing. Even if it's just a paper drawing, it's kind of what the checkpoints are. Um, and then for the two robots, you can see at some point this got dropped off because obviously we released a second robot at some point. Um, and then whether it's completed or what stage it's in. So in this case, this one supposedly last got updated at Deeper. I'm assuming it actually got finished and put on the robot, but. Uh, at the end of the day, these should all be complete over here. So that's kind of roughly how we do ours. Is there any uh, features in Onshape to capture this kind of metadata and, and track I'm very it excited about this. At least from the bomb export thing, and I also started getting better about doing it in Inventor, but the bomb requirements for inspection are gone now, so I'm a little less stressed about it. But the ability to export the bomb from on shape and maybe Ricky knows a little bit more, but I saw there's a way to put it into a Google sheet um, and keep that matched up. And so you can also add custom columns to your um, your bomb and on shape and put your own comments in there. And I think those two sync all the way up. I haven't gone very far down that pathway, but from what I've seen, I can replicate the majority of what I'm doing here. It's exciting. <laughs> I have not gone down that path um, and it's terrible and I get burned out. Well, this, it's just impossible for us to manage how many parts have been cut and what status they're in with two robots and all the kids machining. So we had to do something. It's not perfect, um, but it's, it's a thing that sort of works for us at least. Cool. Um, any other questions? Do you ensure that the different groups like, how do you ensure that the different groups are actually talking to each other so that, like I use that example of being thrown this design where we're trying to fit electronics into these letter slots or you've got uh, an intake that at one part of the swing needs to go through part of the chassis, <laughs> stuff like that. How do you enforce that? That's just a lot of communication. Most of that comes through me. If, like if they miss something that big, it's on, me like if two things are going to hit that much but like they're pretty good about figuring out what kind of like 
we'll do a, we'll do a block robot or Crayola cat or whatever at kind of somewhere at the beginning. You kind of see those in the design reviews. Um, well, we'll kind of lay out space before okay. we ever CAD anything. And that's the Crayola cat is normally driven by me with like kids sitting around basically. And we'll be like, okay, the intake, the climber is going to go here. Drive train is going to kind of look like this. And we get enough of that to where you can build it out. And then we, they're looking, they have a copy of the full robot that they're catting in. They just don't push that copy. Right. So they, they have a local copy that they can check their sub assembly to make sure it's not hitting something else. Um, and that gets updated every night. And so they can double check that what they're doing isn't going to break against somebody else. And if they see that it's breaks, they go talk to somebody and we'll, we'll miss things on occasion, but it's partially my job to check that the other people who are looking at the full assembly were like, Whoa, my, your intake people, why does it not mount right to my drivetrain or whatever? And they'll figure that out. Um, and, and I guess if you're doing that block thing where it's just rough blocks and that kind of, then you've set out the space for say this subsystem, then that acts as the constraint for them to begin with. Right. They have some, but, and, but it's not necessarily, it's never final for any of them. Right. So like if the intake realizes they need more space, then it was just, they have to come back to the negotiation of everybody involved in why do you need that space? Can we get it smaller? Can we figure out like, what's the move? Do we move something else? Uh, I think that that stage is something that I've seen, I've noticed is missing in some of the other teams I've worked with. Um, and so you can easily get down to where, you know, they interfere with each other or, you know, goofy stuff like that. Yeah, we do the same thing. Um, so the first thing we do is just like, what do we want this robot to look like at a super high level? We knew that we were going to have a winch to climb and we had an elevator to deploy a hook. Um, and so literally we drew a rectangle that like represented the space of the elevator and, you know, started fitting that with the shooter and fitting that with the, you know, fitting that with the hopper and stuff. And, you know, eventually it just sorts itself out. Um, or at least for teams that have successful seasons, it does. Yeah, so I mean, so this was during our design review for January 14th. So this is, you know, a little over a week after the start of build season. And we had a rough concept of where everything was going to go on the entire robot, right? The drivetrain subsystem is basically done. They'd already finished most of drivetrain. Um, there were some changes before we actually sent out the final version. Um, but we, it, was, it was definitely further along than everything else. But everything else is just blocks, right? Like there's nothing. Like Shooter had done some stuff, so I was able to import a shooter. Um, so some of this stuff is like kids will CAD kind of block things or all CAD block things if they haven't done it and get something resembling a full robot. Um, so they're all kind of working off of something more than just trying to see what's in each other's imaginations, which doesn't work very well. <laughs> I remember uh, back in the, way back in the day when I was with 118, a uh, long before a lot of teams were doing CAD, perhaps it was during your time, Rachel, when you were with the team is that uh, one of the mentors would get a Sharpie and literally on the concrete floor of the yep. uh, start, start writing out, you know, a, a, come up with a basic uh, frame perimeter and draw that and then just start saying, hey, here's eight inches by 12, here's a battery, whatever the battery dimension is, here's where the wheels go and just start sharking it out. Yep, and we did so, physical electronic layout a lot. I mean, I remember doing that. Yeah, and that, that can still be done today, even though, you know, a lot of teams are moving to CAD. But, I mean, in fact, we did that on the Bargle Fish a couple years ago. We did it with just a piece of cardboard that was cut to be the what we thought the frame ought to be and just start sharpening in um, rough shapes of things. And then you, you build up from there and get more mature. And like Alan said, you negotiate between subsystems if I need more space or I've got more than I need. And yeah, that, that low-tech way can still work well now. I think yeah. one year with Disco, we made – paper doll cut out yeah. of the electrical components, you know, like the PDP and all that, and just sort of shuffling them all around. Yeah, hopefully they produce stickers. Like I know um, Swift, I think, was selling stickers for different electrical components that you could just stick on and then drill the zip tie holes or whatever you needed for it. Um, so that the same thing can be done with one-to-one -one paper cutouts of everything. Uh, one thing yeah, I should I think people on shape. underestimate the uh, print out a one-to-one paste it on a piece of material. You don't need a CNC for a lot of stuff. Nope. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that system. <laughs> so. Um, so there was a question about the bomb and on shape. Again, we're still not experts, but this is what I was able to pull up. You can add a bunch of these columns. When I opened it, it didn't have all these columns. Uh, and there's some additional ones you can add. It looks like these title one, two, and three are custom ones. Um, 
and it does have like a status, I guess you can update here. And then I, I don't have my Onshape linked to Google Docs yet, um, but I think that after you get it linked to Google Docs, you can actually make this, I saw somewhere that you can make this live in uh, Google Sheet, but for now you can also export to a CSV. That's cool. I was gonna mention for Onshape or the electronics, this wasn't something we talked about when you're importing from MKCAD, but um, you can import just the standard, you know, file downloaded from, you know, CTRE's website, but we've created simplified versions of all electronics. It's just the form factor and the mounting holes um, for all those, compo you know, major components for the control system that, you know, reduces load time quite a bit. Yeah, I noticed that when I worked with that, you know, two years ago, that that was a lot better. Uh, okay. Um, anything else we want to cover tonight?